Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff. I am a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from my home, which is located on the territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, the Lekwungen speaking people in Victoria, British Columbia. This series started when we were asked to work at home during the pandemic, and I've had the pleasure of speaking with my colleagues in different departments about their work. Today, we're talking with textile conservator Colleen Wilson, who you can see is at her lab at the Royal BC Museum. Colleen has been at the Royal BC Museum since 1981, and during that time, among her many various daily duties and feature exhibition work, she was the co-editor of the Textile Conservation Newsletter and for a number of years wrote Conservator's Corner for the Royal BC Museum's Discovery Magazine. Many of those articles have been published into the book, into a book called Tales from the Attic, Practical Advice on Preserving Heirlooms and Collectibles. That book is available from the Royal BC Museum and contains some of the advice you might hear today. Hi, Colleen. Hello, Kim. <laughs> so Colleen, we should jump right in. Washing delicates in old textiles, why or why not? Yeah. Okay, um, it's usually the first question that people ask of me is, I have this old thing and I want to wash it and how can I do it safely? And I must say as a textile conservator, I have washed many textiles at the museum, but it's not, it's not something I do lately and it's not something I do often. Um, so I'm gonna start this with asking the, your audience, your, um, to ask themselves why they would want to wash something. Um, when you wash a textile, you lose quite a bit. You lose evidence of use. You lose, um, if there's any soil or paint or sweat on it, you'll lose that and that may be good and that may be bad. Um, we tend to think that washing will make everything better, but we've both mostly been brainwashed by detergent sales campaign. That have led us to think that dirt is really really bad. It will make textiles um, deteriorate more quickly, attract moths, things like that. That's not always the case. Um, you can imagine if we had Emily Carr's painting smock and it had paint and coffee stains all over the front of it, and we washed that and got all that out, it would be a much less interesting painting smock because we would have removed the evidence of whether she drank coffee or tea, what kind of paint she used. Um, so sometimes you want to save the dirt as evidence. Um, all, washing also relaxes fibers so that um, folds and creases will be removed and that may also be evidence of use in the past. I, was, I found this little bit of pleated um, edging for a petticoat. If you wash that you would lose all those pleats. It would be very difficult to put them back again. So you have to think when you want to wash, why you want to wash it and what you might, might lose. You also want to think about what you want to wash it for. Are you going to wear this thing? Are you going to put it on display? Are you going to put it in storage? Those all make a difference to how clean you want it to be, whether you're likely to wash it again. So you need to think about that when you're thinking about washing. It's with all old things are not always, we're not always designed to be washed every week the way our current clothes are. So washing them can be a once in a lifetime experience for an old textile. If you're going to do it, you want to do it safely, but maybe you don't want to do it at all because the thing was never designed to be washed in the first place. So are there some alternatives then? If, if it's not, if it should not be washed, what else could we do? Okay, if it's like a large textile that you have hanging on the floor, you might want to just vacuum it. Um, you want to get the surface dust off it, the surface dirt. Um, when, I when I vacuum a textile, which I do way more often than washing it, I'll put a screen on it and I'll vacuum it through the screen. Alternately, if it's a, a dimensional thing, I have a soft one that I can put over. Sometimes I'll use the vacuum hose and a soft brush, and you can't find one right now, and just brush, brush the dust off the thing to it. You want to remove the dust in the museum at least, you want to remove the dust that's in that is accumulated in the museum. We don't want to remove the soil that the artifact came with. The other alternative that people tend to think of when they think of textiles is dry cleaning, because they think that dry cleaners are the experts in cleaning textiles. And dry cleaning does have its advantages. Um, 
but it also has disadvantages. Um, there are many drop dyes that will run in water that don't run in the solvents that are used in, in um, dry cleaning. There are many fibers that will swell and then shrink in water that won't do that in dry cleaning. However, the dry cleaning solvents being so toxic, they have to be done in an enclosed system. So instead of doing it gently by hand in a basin on your kitchen counter, they have to do it in the equivalent of a washing machine but that has solvents. So the thing gets churned around and then it has to go into a dryer to extract all the things. So it gets a lot of mechanical agitation that um, gentle hand washing avoids. The other thing is that the dry cleaner's business is to make your dirty suit look as good as new and the dry cleaning process the solvent strips out any finishes that the textile might have so they routinely in the rinse put in a synthetic resin that gives it that body feel of new again um, if you have an old thing it never had those resins in it in the first place those resins are not designed to last for a hundred years without changing they're designed to last until the next dry cleaning um, so you you don't necessarily want to do that with your old textile if this is going to be a once in a lifetime experience for it. You're going to be adding something to it that it didn't originally have and that maybe not be stable over the long term. Okay. I was just thinking, um, Colleen, I know some folks who after their wedding, they'll get their wedding dress dry cleaned and then, and then think then use that dry cleaning bag and just hang it up in the closet. Is that what they should be doing? <laughs> um, it's, if it's a contemporary wedding dress, that yes, it, that's not a bad idea at all. Better than to put it away soil. Um, the dry cleaning bag is not maybe such a good idea, and hanging it is maybe not such a great idea. I would be more inclined to get a large, large tote and some acid-free tissue and gently fold the wedding dress, interleaving it with tissue into a box. Um, the plastic of the dry cleaning bags um, is not the most stable plastic, but you can get plastic totes that are quite stable. And mm, you don't want, P you know, plastic now has those little <coughs> triangles on it. You don't want PVC and you don't want mixed plastics, but ABS and polyethylene are quite stable plastics, at least as stable as we know plastics ever to be. Great. Um, you might, if you're an a environmentally responsible person, think that you might go with a green dry cleaner, solvent-free dry cleaner, or a solvent-free dry cleaner that just washes things. Um, oh. Yeah. You, All right. Yeah. So, okay. So if, you're, if you are dealing with some of those older materials, maybe something you've inherited or that's been passed down in, through your family, what are some considerations you should look for? Okay, you want to look at the fibers that it's made of. Um, things that are made of wool and silk are protein fibers. Things that are cotton and linen are cellulose fibers. And things that are polyester and acetate and nylon are synthetic fibers. And all of those respond differently to cleaning and to getting wet. Um, protein fibers and people have so many stories about shrinking lovely wool sweaters. Protein fibers um, don't like to be alkaline and they don't like heat very much. You can wash those, but you have to make sure that you use very neutral detergent and that you keep them cool. Cellulose fibers, on the other hand, cotton and then those things can stand and benefit in cleaning from quite high temperatures and alkaline conditions. So when you, yeah, we go from there to detergent, because you want to select the detergent that's going to be most suitable. And um, people say, oh, how about if I just use woolite? And I actually found these old things in the lab that I've never used. Woolite doesn't look like this when you buy it anymore. Dry sap in area. My predecessor uses, it's a naturally occurring anionic surfactant, it's the roots of a plant. And in the past, when people realized that washing delicate woolen things was hard on them, they found that you could, yeah, as practical today as in Roman times for gentle natural cleaning. I don't know if you can even get this anymore. And sure, you used to be able to buy this in 
quilt shops, and I don't know whether you can anymore. The problem with any of the commercial things that you buy for washing delicate products is that they usually are not just the cleaning agent. They usually have perfumes in them so that they smell good. They usually have dyes in them so that they look clean. You don't usually see brown detergent. It's usually pink or blue or something nice and fresh looking. They also usually have optical brighteners in them. So an optical brightener is a dye that reflects ultraviolet light. So there used to be an um, advertising campaign about describing how they get your white whiter than whiter than white. This is because the optical brighteners reflect light that wouldn't previously have been reflected. These are not appropriate for historic textiles. Um, optical brighteners have not been in use for more than about 50 years. Um, so anything older than that would never have had it. They're also not very stable. They can, tend to turn yellow more quickly than other dyes. Um, so buying something, using something off the shelf is kind of difficult um, because it's, they're selling to a mass market that expects different things of their detergent. What I use, well, I think there's a difference between detergents and soaps. Soaps tend to be more alkaline. Soaps are really good for cellulose, for, you know, for your linen damask tablecloth, for your cotton petticoats. Um, you can wash those really hot with a soap and it will come out really clean. Um, the problem is finding real soap. Almost all soaps, ivory snow used to be 99% pure. It was even more than that. It was 99.44% percent pure and it was soap it's not anymore it's a detergent um, the only soap powder i can find is this is a product endorsement here but this is actually soap granules soap needs hot water to actually dissolve but it will get cellulose things really clean the one thing you need a detergent and detergents are engineered for different water temperatures to address different kinds of soils. That's why you'll have um, laundry detergent, you'll have dishwasher detergent, you'll have dishwashing detergent, there's cold water detergents, there's warm water detergents. Detergents, because they're um, ultimately come out of the petroleum industry, they can be um, engineered for specific circumstances. But again, if they're commercially available, they're probably going to have dyes and perfumes and optical brighteners in them. Um, what we use in the lab here is, um, I get it at Warden Mercantile, where it's sold for washing baby lambs and cows udders and fluffy puppies and things like that. It's just an anionic surfactant. It's very gentle. It has no perfumes and brighteners in it. Um, it's sold as Orvis, sold as WA Paste, so it is Canpac 645. What it is chemically is sodium lauryl sulfate and nothing else. Um. So just to re recap, soap, yeah. soap for cellulose um, materials, maybe like linen and detergent for almost everything else? Yes, and in fact, if you're not sure, you should use the, de the, the detergent and not hot water if you're unsure. Um, Great. If you go into a fabric store now, they'll have a, a section with linen in it. And most of the time it's not linen. Linen is used to describe a fabric with a nubbly surface. Um, linen is a fiber from a flax plant. Uh, was in the past used for things like damask tablecloths, but odds are if you have a new tablecloth, it's polyester. And the soaps are not particularly effective on synthetics. In fact, nothing is all that effective on synthetics, which is why there's the optical brighteners and bleaches and things like that. The, the other thing, when you're, talk, when you're considering your elderly textile and wanting to clean it, you have to think of the fiber that it's made of, but also any decorations or dyes that it might have. This is a nice little piece of weaving. This is what happens when it gets wet. The pink all comes off. So you have, if you're going to wash something 
and it has any color in it, you'll want to test the color that the dyes are stable. So you get, you mix up a little bit of detergent and water and put it on, on the color with some blotting paper, paper towel, toilet paper, something that's quite absorbent so that the wet dye doesn't spread elsewhere into the textile so that it just goes into the blotting material. But you need to check every color that's there. So if you have a sampler, it's kind of tricky because there'll be lots of, lots of different colored yarns. You want to check every single one of them so that you don't end up with everything else clean except all the area around the green letters. Oh kind of cloudy with green. Um, samplers are a good one. Any kind of embroidery like that, you have to check every single color. You can wash a carpet, but you have to check every single color to make sure that they won't run. It also, any kind, you have to look at all things, at all decorations. As I said, lots of things were not designed to be washed. Um, this is a part of a, a sleeve of a garment from, I'm guessing, about 1900 and it has sequins on it and the chances are these sequins are not the plastic sequins that we know and love from our early ballet classes <laughs> but are um, sequins made of gelatin so if you were to get those wet they'd all turn to slime oh, so wow. yeah so you need to to check all the decorations the same thing is true if you send something to the dry cleaner they have to check um, all the buckles and buttons and trims, because some things that won't dissolve in water will dissolve in dry cleaning solvent. Another concern about dry cleaning is if they find that, they'll take all those decorations off. And if this was, you know, the wedding dress that your grandmother made and all the buttons she sewed on herself, maybe you don't want them to cut them all off and sew them back on again. Mm -hmm. No. What if no. there's damage, speaking of, speaking of cutting off buttons or things, what if there's damage to the material? Okay. Um, what I do is I um, reinforce it with nylon mat. No, big piece of nylon mat. Um, I'll baste a bit of nylon tool over a damaged area, um, and that just gives it a bit of strength. So that because when it's wet, a uh, textile is at its most fragile. The weight of the water in the fibers just makes it much heavier and so the fibers are more likely to break. So a bit of nylon net basted over a damaged area will give that area some support when it's in the water. If it's fragile all, all over like a piece of lace, sometimes I'll put it between the whole thing between two layers of net. The, the catch with doing that is that it's really tempting to put too much basting in, but after it's been washed, you need to get that all out so that you can block it out and dry it flat. So sometimes just putting a layer of net, putting the lace, putting another layer of net over the top of it gives you something to hold and you don't even need to baste it, but the basting is not a bad idea. Um, so if you've considered then, you've looked closely at your material, you've check for damage, you've spot tested that the dye is not going to run, uh, you, you know your decorations are okay, you pick your detergent. Yep. And you just mentioned, does water matter? Do you yes. need a special kind Thank of water? You. <laughs> you do. You. In Victoria, we're really lucky. We have lovely soft water and um, it's pretty clean too. Um, this this <laughs> um, whole talk about washing textiles is only good for Victoria. If you cannot send this to your relatives in Calgary and say, look, you can do this at home. Because in places where there's hard water, what you have in the water is a lot of calcium and magnesium ions. These are positively charged ions in the water. Um, soil, uh, what is it? Soil tends to be negatively charged. The calcium, and the fibers tend to be negatively charged. The calcium and magnesium ions get in there in between the soil and the fiber and clink them all together. Negative, positive, negative, and they hold on tighter. So what you get is redeposited soil, which is much more difficult to get out. And so instead of coming out cleaner, your textiles come out kind of gray with the dirt spread all over and locked on much more tightly. So if you have hard water, don't wash your textiles at all. 
unless you have a still and you can produce vast quantities of distilled water that doesn't have those positive ions in it. Um, <laughs> A, a, a colleague of mine in the distant past, she thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll put Calgon in the water, too. And she washed something that had pearl buttons on it. Calgon um, sequesters the calcium out of the water, but it also sequestered the calcium off the pearl buttons and oh, okay. came to the surface of it. So don't try to add something to the water to, to correct it. Don't use hard water for washing textile. As I said, Victoria, we're really fortunate in having soft water. So this is good advice for Victoria, but not good advice for everywhere. And I've heard the expression hard water and soft water before, but how do you know if you have hard or soft water? <coughs> um, you generally know you get crust building up in your kettle. Soap and shampoo won't suds up. It makes your tea taste awful, and that's, that's what you're used to. Okay. <laughs> And I'm sure it varies across BC. It'd be Absolutely. really interesting to know if there's anyone out there who has experience in different communities, if their water's hard or soft. So if it was a soft water community, they yeah. could use these yeah. techniques. Yeah. Although I know that some places up the coast have what they call cedar water. It's quite a lot of um, brown discoloration in it. But mm. yeah, in Victoria, I, I, yeah, this is an exclusive treatment for people in Victoria. <laughs> So, no, what are, okay. so what are the mechanics of doing the okay. actual washing? So we, vac we vacuum the leaves stuff off. So, and you've got to reinforce the, the damage areas. You want to wash it flat. As I said, the, the, um, so I've got, okay. so I've got some nice flat basins that I use. Um, you want to use detergent in, okay, you get your pencil ready, 0.2% solution of detergent is all you need. It's not very much. So that means that you can work off some of your, what to help this poor old textile energy by doing arithmetic. Measure how much water is going to go into your basin and figure out the volume and figure out 0.2% of that and that's how much detergent you need. This, ah, this thing, it's about $50, will do you for many, 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 many um, delicate textiles. So a uh, different size basin, depending on how big it is. I don't want a whole bunch of extra water. And if you're having to use your still to distill it, you certainly don't want to have a whole bunch of extra water. So you put your very delicate textile in here. This, which I want with you. Oh, I forgot. Okay, to step back a bit to the running dyes. So you've tested your dyes and you find that it runs. What you can also do is mix up a solution of about 0.5% um, vinegar and test it with that. Because some dyes will run in water and will be stabilized by vinegar. But some dyes will run in, in vinegar acetic acid solution. So then you can mix up a solution of a little bit of ammonia. Some dyes will be stabilized by ammonia and some will run more in ammonia. But you want to test this before you put it in the water because you can use that information in the final rinse. What you don't want to put in the water, old wise way of stabilizing that, put salt in the final rinse. The vinegar and the ammonia are volatile. They will evaporate with water. So as it dries, the vinegar or the ammonia go away. Salt doesn't. Salt will then remain on the textile, which is not a good thing. Okay. Anyway, so you've got your delicate textile in here, rather small, and your water. Put it into a bit of water with just a little touch of detergent first and let it soak for maybe 15 minutes and then pour, pour the water off. Then your 0.2% solution and sponge it very gently all over. This is as much agitation as you need to do. Just sponge it and you're kind of sucking the water up with the sponge rather than smashing it into the bottom of the basin. You're sucking it up. And at some point, you want to turn it over very gently and do the other side. 
one of the times. The, so, the orb is, is very foamy, so it, it really feels like you need to excited on that. Um, we're just going to let it soak there for a minute. As I step back and, and what I have under this table, this table is a top. This is a big washing basin. So they said, you want a basin that's about the size of the textile you're using? This is the big washing tank we we'll use for washing things like the hotel beds, the bedspread that's on the bed in the hotel or in the museum exhibit. Very flat, we'll do it very gently with a sponge, just sucking it up. And then we'll pour off the water and put in rinse water. And we'll pour off the rinse water and put in more rinse water. And they'll say, how many rinses? Lots and lots and lots of rinses. We want to make sure all the detergent is gone. If you've determined that the dyes that are unstable are made stable by a bit of acid in the water, you can then put your vinegar rinse for the final rinse, pour it off, and gather up the huge stack of towels that you got ready beforehand. Okay. Roll the textile into the towel wet. And roll it out again onto the table. Depending on what kind of structure it has, you maybe want to just block it out flat. If it's very large, like a tablecloth, you could um, leave the corners. These are blocks of glass. Later blocks of wood with mylar over them, um, just so that it's nice and smooth and the weight will keep it stable as it dries. If it is something like a piece of lace, you maybe want to pin it out, to block it out, um, and put it under tension. And this is just a piece of Donnacona board with plastic over it. But if you're going to do that, you want to check the pins that you're going to use. Um, these are pins that I tested in the past. Lots of pins will rust if they're left wet, and you certainly don't want to get rusty pin marks on something that you've taken a lot of care. Oh my gosh, that would be awful. <laughs> yes. Um, so you put it block out, blot it with your towels, get as much moisture off it as you can. If it's a three-dimensional thing like a garment, you can use that nylon net to stuff it inside the sleeves, to stuff it inside the body. You want as much air circulation as possible. You can use a fan to move the air. What you don't want to do is use any heat or direct sunlight on it. You want it just to drive by the air, moving fresh, fresh, um, dry air over it. Right, so you've got it clean. Yep. It's it's dry. It's been rinsed. It's clean and dry. Now what? How how do how we keep it from that, getting dirty? That's, that's where you need to go back to where you started. What do you want to do with it? What you should do is let it get dirty again. So if you're going to, if it's a sampler or something like that, and you're putting it on display, you should put it on display behind the glass so that it doesn't get dirty again. You don't want to. Well, I am a civil servant, so. I try to avoid work as much as possible. Um, so you don't want to wash it again, but it's also, you don't want to subject your delicate historic textile to washing unnecessarily. So if you're going to display it, display it behind glass. If you're, for instance, wanting to wear this garment because it's a special family heirloom and it's a special event, um, wear an undergarment so that you protect the the, tech, the, the historic garment from your body. So a t-shirt, a full, you know, full dress underneath your grandmother's wedding dress if you're going to wear it. Try to protect it from getting, getting soil. Um, if, if you are going to wear a historic garment for a special occasion, maybe just wear it for the photographs and when you go out for dinner afterwards, change to something that you can slop food on. Um, That's a great idea. Colleen, thank yeah. you. Is there any, anything, any final tips? Not, I always forget something, but I don't think I've forgotten. I, yeah, it's been fantastic. If yeah. people were taking notes and they were like, what did she say? How much was that? Um, this is recorded. And so <laughs> if you're watching live, you will be able to go back to the recording, uh, which is on the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. 
but I mentioned at the beginning, Colleen also has a book called Tales from the Attic, which is practical advice for caring for um, uh, your heirlooms and including washing. So that is available at the Royal BC Museum and you can buy it online as well. Ooh, there's my dog saying hello. <laughs> um, I just wanna... say, if you go online, the Canadian Conservation Institute, the CCI, has lots of literature available online and they have a whole section on textiles and washing them. Excellent. So the Canadian Conservation Institute can give you advice. Or if you don't want to do this themselves, maybe there's someone there you can hire or contract to do a job for you. Yeah, that's that's actually a much more difficult thing to find. There are not very many private textile uh, companies available. And Kim, I will add, there's um, uh, Colleen worked on, um, uh, it was the Lieutenant Governor's uniform that came to the museum several years ago, and on the learning portal in the pathway called the Royal Treatment, there's a photo essay that Colleen worked on that breaks down how she worked on the conservation of that uniform. It's so interesting. Well, there's, and there's a little video of me working on the Pemberton dress. Oh, that's in there as well? Yeah. That is might be in the family family exhibition pathway in there or the so, gold rush exhibition. or the gold rush <laughs> yes yeah. yeah so we can do, share we'll share those links yeah do look at the learning portal uh, I want to again thank you Colleen that voice you hear is Liz she's there in the studio uh, with a very steady cam thank you Liz uh, and some some good tips too the Royal BC Museum has reopened and we are ready to welcome you back you can find out more on our website about time tickets and which exhibits are available we will be continuing our at home, at home kids and at outside for the foreseeable future. However, this program at home will be moving to Tuesdays only in July and August. Links for these programs are posted on the Royal BC Museum's website. I'm going to be taking some holidays in July, but my colleague Chris O'Connor will host at homes and in, until I get back. So until then, take care of yourselves and one another. Thank you. I actually should move the towel, shouldn't I?